Excellent. Uh, welcome to the Northampton Policing Review Commission. This is the Alternatives to Policing Subcommittee. Today is March 10, 2021. This meeting, it's going to run from 7.30 to 9. Uh, it's being recorded and it's being streamed over, uh, recorded over Zoom. Um, we're going to call to order uh, and we're going to start with roll call. Noah? Okay. Booker? Here. Javier? Here. Alex? Here. Carol? Here. Great, Excellent. Thanks. We have quorum. Um, approval of meeting minutes. Uh, everybody was able to take a look to the minutes that Noah sent. No. Yep. Alex? Alex, were you able to say? Excellent. So oh, I'm sorry. Looking, yeah. I'm looking for I a moved, motion. I move the... acceptance to of the minutes. A second. Awesome. And Booker? Yes. Javier? Yes. Alex? Yes. Carol. I approve, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we're gonna move to um, item number two in our agenda, which is public comment. Um, public comment is gonna be, Booker, are we doing it for 15? Mm -hmm. um, we've, we've never set that limit, but I think yeah. with the number of people on the call that we're likely to be there. Perfect, so uh, we're gonna move to public comment. Uh, each person will have three minutes to for public comment. Booker will time it. When it's your time, Booker will ask you to sort of wrap up your thoughts, and we're going to move to the next person. If you are uh, on your computer, uh, if you go to the bottom of the screen in the reaction section, you're going to find the raise hand feature. If you are in a phone, uh, I want to say asterisk six, I always forget about this. It's between asterisk six and nine. Uh, one is to raise your hand. The other is for unmute you. Dan, do you remember? Sorry. Asterisk nine to raise your hand and asterisk six to unmute. You got it. Excellent. <laughs> well, you wrote it. So, <laughs> so we're going to start with public comment right now. And we're going to have the first person, Ed Olmsted. Ed, you're muted. Unmute. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> uh, thanks for all your hard work as usual. Um, I just, um, I, I went to the, I was at the meeting last night, I think it was last night. Um, and other times uh, I've heard that the police budget has increased substantially over the past 10 years or so. And then hearing the dispatch says the range of services they could utilize has decreased over time uh, struck me. Also with my observation of the mental health system, um, it's become more efficient at streamlining services and basing services on medical necessity related to diagnosis and some other factors. But you know, people come to a mental health agency to get help and support uh, for understanding and solving problems. A significant portion of people don't care about a diagnosis. Diagnosis. Uh, so it reinforces, in my mind, for alternatives, there should be programs where professionals are allowed to meet with and help people based only on their request for help with stress and distress. Crisis services can probably see most people and be paid for their services. Uh, but I suspect that the resources that do not require diagnosis are the ones that have disappeared from the dispatch resource list and are the ones um, where they exist that tend not to come with livable wages, or opportunities for advancement, or solid parent-friendly benefits. Um, as a program director for an outreach mental health program for a few years, and some of the basic services we provided were simple, like getting people around to their doctors and therapists and food stamp housing, you know, probation, other appointments. Uh, these were crucial, but they were not well-paying jobs. And um, I think that the alternatives uh, that this committee is suggesting could be really helpful in that. And so I'm encouraging that. Um, I, one other thing to say, but I don't know whether I have time to say this or not. 
I just uh, thinking about domestic violence, I thought, you know, there's with domestic violence uh, calls from police and trying to help people in domestic violence situations, uh, there's a lot of sense of helplessness. The person uh, often who is being the abuser feels helpless because the other person is going to leave or is going is not doing what they want and they act out violently. The person they're acting against feels helpless because they're overwhelmed. And sometimes the police feel uh, can also feel overwhelmed and helpless in that situation. And I think that empowerment for all three of those um, uh, individuals, uh, well, it could be more than that, but it could be um, a way to, uh, to concentrate uh, domestic violence services, to focus it on people need, need to feel empowered and successful, but also follow the rules um, about not harming other people. Um, so I just, uh, Thanks for that. I appreciate your work on that. And I know that's a difficult uh, subject to find an, uh, solutions to. But um, I think men in particular are often seen as have, having power. The power and control wheel suggests that men are in, in those situations are empowered. But they're often victims of abuse and feel actually powerless and need help with empowerment as well. Um, so thank you for the uh, time. Thank you so much. Uh, um, okay, so I, I saw that people came in while I was uh, doing public comment. So we are now in the section of public comment. So if you want to speak, please uh, just raise your hand or unmute yourself. If you are on the phone, asterisk 9 to raise your hand, asterisk 6 to unmute. Um, call in user one. Hi everyone, it's Jane Doe. I'm checking in. I wanted to follow up because I was cut off on Saturday. What I'm thinking now after reading all of the minutes for every single meeting that you've had and listening to you extensively is that at some point domestic violence was transferred to this committee. I think that was a a prop, something that happened that may have affected the outcomes of the research into DV um, adversely. And then secondarily, on the front end, when you tried or your efforts to try to set up research in this area may have been affected by the late start and sort of the exodus of some of the commissioners. But somehow, and this is not an insult, the ball got dropped. And I really feel like this got the short shrift it's life threatening for me and I don't I can't I can't overstate that enough. But my second concern is that in other areas of crime, also that kind of research and data collection hasn't happened. Serious crimes. I don't know if that was because you were not able to get it from the district attorney or the police or the FBI records, but I can obtain it myself. And if I can get it. I would think with all the advanced degrees, you could certainly get it. It's really important to hear from victims. I realize it's late, but somehow the section on domestic violence, it's got to be noted that it's just not sufficient. You just didn't get this right. It's not that you're bad people, but it's not complete. Um, and I think when you have a lot of commissioners right now saying things that are not based on real research and experiences firsthand with victims, it's dangerous. There's a lot of discussion about having unarmed officers, and I hear commissioners say things that are not bound in fact or in law, which is a problem. So that's my first assessment. The second thing is that in saying that you shouldn't have armed police officers, when the call comes in, you don't know what you're going to encounter, and it can change on a dime. In Queens, a couple of weeks ago, three officers were shot. I mean, it happens very fast. And you have to kind of understand that. Um, the arrests, the temporary and the permanent restraining orders are really important to stop the violence and allow the victim to get safe. You didn't focus on that enough. And I go back to that preliminary report that was really sort of pro-criminal to me as a victim, 
because you spend a lot of time talking about what the defendant needed, how not to shame a defendant in jail. Javier spoke about not wanting someone with a gun to show up. I don't know if that's a cultural thing, but the gun is what stops it. When you have someone who may be armed in a house, it may be that that police officer is the only person to stop the crime. So it's re- I just, it's really important that you get this right. And that if you don't listen to me as a victim, giving you firsthand testimony that you do do the research or admit that you didn't do the research again, other crimes. Oh, I'm last sorry. Night, I have to cut you off because it's three minutes. I, but I want you, I want to give you the opportunity to finish your thought. You know, I'm just going to try to write up what I can, and hopefully the submission form will work, and that'll have to be that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next one, uh, Lily P. Hi. This is going to be pretty short today. Um, I've said it before, and I'll say it again, that when these alternatives are put in place, when they're recommended, um, when there's a real possibility of them being used, um, there needs to first be widespread education on them and how to use them, and they also need to be accessible. If these alternatives are meant for those who are mentally ill or neurodiverse or uh, addicts, et cetera, they need to be easily accessible. Um, meaning like if there is a very long like process and difficult process of like applying for um, longer term therapy or say, um, we can't think of words right now, but when, when these processes take a lot amount of time or when they're complicated, when they're hard to understand for someone going through a lot of stuff, then that basically means that they're in effect not effective. Um, so I just need to say that like, these need to be understandable and people need to be able to like comprehend them easily, basically to be able to use them properly. Uh, and I just want y'all to keep that in mind when you're looking for different alternatives. Thank you so much. Um, do we have anybody else for public comment? Uh, there, there it is. Uh, Yaping, you're up. Hello. Um, <laughs> nice to see you all again. <laughs> Many nights a week. Um, <laughs> I, I wanted to comment on um, some of the comments made last night about accountability and just um, put in my, um, uh, what's the word? Um, I, I hope the committee, um, sorry, that your subcommittee um, is able to flesh out a little more the details of accountability that I think Javier and Josie brought up yesterday. Oops, um, sorry, I accidentally muted. Um, um, just that I thought they made a good point about guidance being um, a little too vague and that some specifics around accountability in a proposed new department would be really helpful. Um, and that I, it seems like the whole commission is going um, towards the recommendations of a new department, but um, just wanted to reiterate how wonderful we think that would be in Northampton. And we re- would be really grateful if the commission um, sort of sets that standard for city council, since you all have the ability to dream a little bigger maybe than the, the city councilors might be in their meetings. Um, and same with the, you know, a peer led model and cahoots um, style response to everything. Thanks so much. Bye. Oh, thank you, Jeping. Do we have anybody else? We're going to wait a little bit and see if anybody else wants to be part. Booker, I think that's it for finishing and closing for the comment. I'm going to pass the chair to you. Thank you. Our um, agenda for this evening really only included continued work on editing our document. Um, since we will likely have a guest later in this meeting, I would propose that we go on to ongoing editing of our document. Um, is that okay with everyone else on the committee? I'm seeing everybody saying yes. Yep. Okay. Um, 
I actually have two things to upload into the document. I'm, I'm a little like David Hoos. I have problems working with things like um, Google Docs. So um, I could upload from here um, into the Google Doc document. Do you want to begin with what's already there and begin to talk about that? Or should we, and by the way, I haven't looked at the most recent document to see if Carol's um, document had entered that larger field or not. Yeah, I don't know whether, <clears throat> is Noah here? Oh, yes. Yeah, hi. Do, do you know, I mean, I, I submitted something late today that was a rewrite. Is that, should I bring that up or I guess? I'm, so, I'm gonna interrupt, okay. Alex. If we brought up the most recent version of the Google document of what uh, the program looks like, could we enter things into that document? Mm -hmm. um, so I would ask Dan, who is here, I believe, mm -hmm. because Dan has a working document. Um, so Dan, do you think, <laughs> I don't know how that's, could, could we just edit that document? Um, and uh, insert the things that, that we have to insert? Um, yeah, I would say go for it. I've sort of moved over to a whole separate document to like take in the, the things that everyone's been sending in asynchronously just because it was getting messy trying to keep track of <laughs> what edits were made. So if you want to make, if you want to edit that one, that's fine. Um, and then I'll transfer them over. Um, so yeah, that's fine. Whatever works for you all. Um, which document should Dan, could you either put into the chat which document you would like us to use or? Um... Um, yeah, I think we all received that in, in preparation for last night, because if you put it in the chat, then everyone can edit it. Yeah, I can just share it in the chat. No, if, if you do that, then uh, everyone, all the the members of the public can edit the document freely as well. Uh, so I think we should use the one we received in our email and then share that on the screen. Okay, I can I mean, also just send it to one person and then, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, if, yeah. If we can have just one person mm -hmm. turning the screen in and sort of making the edits mm -hmm. rather than sort of doing it all together. Yeah, let me, uh, let me grab it. <laughs> And I have to say, uh, Alex, I, the, I, um, I found it really, really interesting and really good, the, the, the faces to address look, the concerns in relationship to, to DV, sexual assault, and other things, right? and giving that responsibility to, in the best case scenario, to uh, the new department to explore those possibilities in depth rather than, you know, we have been trying proactively inviting uh, organizations working in the V and haven't been possible for one reason or another. So I do think that using this sort of phase one and phase two with phase one with things that we're sure that can be moved into a new department and phase two things that need a deeper study by, you know, by a professional in charge of the department, that sounds great. So Noah, the document that you just placed into the chat, I think is um, Carol's mental health crisis response document. Okay. What, uh, what document do you need? Um, Instead. Let's, let's leave this there for now. And we can, um, we did have an opportunity to see the documents that Alex had uploaded. Um, and I'll have to see if my um, other documents are within the other report, but let's look at Carol's document for now. Is that all right? Which I'm, I'm sorry, I can do, are all of you pulling it up or I can screen share what I have? Yeah, I don't see it in the chat. Ooh. Yeah, if you're gonna screen share it, Booker, that would be great. Okay. Yeah, that would be better.
I don't really want to do this. Um, I did a um, upgrade and it's saying if in order to allow it to let me share the screen, I've got to go out of Zoom and come back in. I don't really want to do that. Um, mm. Actually, I'm going to do it anyway. Let's see what happens. Unless you want to make me an, a, a co-editor and then I'll pull it up. I'll tell you what, I'm going to leave. I'll be right back. Don't do okay. anything special until I come back. Have a good ride. Welcome back. Can you see this document? It's tiny. Can you uh, maximize the text? Booker, if you go to the top and open with, it's going to open in a full page uh, there we on, go. in Google. Oh, Earth. that's true. Yeah. Okay. Um, is it still too small? I can read it, uh, but are we going to make edits to this? Because um, I don't think we'll be able, this is um, not in a it is a Google Drive, but. So, Booker, if you go to all the way to the top and open with, right on, uh, like above recommend, recommendation on the document, it says open with. Just a second. Sorry, I'm um, in a, I had to shut down everything. Um, Noah, could you reshare that document uh, in oh. the chat? Because when yeah. I logged out, I lost the chat. Totally. Let me. Could I ask, um, Carol? Are you able? Do you have the document? Would you be able to? Yeah, share I could. It? You have to give me a co-editor. I'll I'll pull it up. Okay. Just thinking, Carol, as the person who wrote it. Um, yeah, I've got it. I've got it right here. It. I have it here. Yeah. Uh, everyone should be co co an editor. Co uh, okay. Yeah. A, a co host because I can do screen share then. Oh. Right. I. Okay. Here. 
Okay, can I do it now? Yeah. Yeah. Hold on. Screen share. Okay, there we go. Okay, there we go. It's big enough, right? Yeah. Yes. Shall I read it or what? What do you want? What would you like? Or do you want to read it yourself? Um, why don't you read it, Carol? Okay. And right. let's. Look, I'm going to suggest that you read a paragraph, and if everyone would like to comment, then they can comment at that point. Okay. And then this Alex, first. The, the, sorry, just the embol yeah, the embold. I'm sorry. Yeah. Alex. Go oh, ahead. maybe you're about to explain now. Which which parts are the, the format? I was going to explain the format. Yeah. The embol there's an emboldened part, and then there's a context, and I imagine that these two sections. The emboldened part is the recommendation. The context explains a little bit why. And then when we get down here, I indicate that the rest, which is very lengthy, that we've looked at before, that the suggestion in this subcommittee was to put move, move that if it's going to be entered at all, it needs to go in the appendix. It lists, it lists various different models we looked at that are pervasive around the country. And then, you know, concluding that, you know, referring back to, um, then the end refers, well, the end, this part, I'm gonna need got, got real guidance on because I don't know how much public comment to pull in here that relates to mental health crisis dispatch. But the very end is, you know, talks a lot about peer led mental health the importance of having people with lived experience, et cetera. And, and then the references are at the bottom. So let me just go back. I think the most relevant thing to look at tonight is, is that first section. Yeah, for the section that you just refer, I mean, certainly we have gotten a fair amount of in public comment um, and in Shandana and testimonies that he has been able to gather in relation to mental health experiences with police attending to those mental health crises. We have somebody also addressing that in public comment in last Saturday, right? So I right. think we're, I think on our sun, uh, Sunday meeting, we're going to be able to sort of input that. The other, any other, any other clips of, from the testimony or, yeah. well, that came in from the, the document. Yeah. yeah survey. Okay, so this first section, just again, the emboldened part is the um, sort of an executive summary of the of our <clears throat> recommendation. We strongly endorse the, the development of an alternative to policing mental health crisis response model for Northampton that would be locally relevant and drawn from the experience of the CAHOOTS model, which has functioned successfully in Eugene, Oregon for 32 years. Let's go on to the second paragraph. Okay. Cahoots dispatch is handled by a non-policing team rather than by the Eugene Police Department. The response team that works out of a van is usually comprised of a medic. I could say EMT if you thought that was more, <clears throat> more uh, clear. Medic and a mental health crisis worker. Often the crisis worker is someone with lived experience of a mental illness. In this way, the CAHOOTS model works on the basis of what the Northampton Commission has heard so, so much public comment on, which is the value of involving programming that is peer led. Does anyone have comments about that paragraph? Um, the CAHOOTS dispatch is handled by a non-policing team. Does that just mean dispatch is in a different department like ours is? Uh, yeah, or, yes, or yes. Are you, it, saying, are you using the word yes. dispatch to mean? No, dispatch, um, my understanding is, and we can clarify this tonight. Oh, there's Dan. Um, 
Um, it 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 um, comes in on nine one. The dispatch picks up on nine one in, in Eugene. Picks up on nine one one calls, uh, and I believe they the dispatch also takes referrals from the police. So, but it but it, it my impression is it's a separate dispatch, just like we were talking about in Northampton. <clears throat> okay, not that Cahoots has its own dispatch. I no, I don't believe that. I'm going to make a note. We're going to clarify so that. Would, yeah, I would suggest my suggestion would be um, crisis calls may be directed to a non-policing team rather than the Eugene Police Department. Because I actually think that's going to be closer to what's going to happen. What uh, to say cahoots? What what was that? Because I don't think it's cahoots. Um, I don't think it's going to be a cahoots dispatch. It's crisis or nine one one calls can be directed to a non policing team rather than the Eugene Police Department. So change the sentence. Yeah. <clears throat> and certainly we can sort of confirm and sort of double check this mm -hmm. with team later are uh, handled by uh, but, and i think the rest of the paragraph is really good handled by an, uh, Okay, they're fine. Uh, and it places focus on the idea of looking at <clears throat> for people with experience rather than, uh, pardon me, um, lived experience rather than a, a different model. Actually, I'm. We should wait for the third paragraph, but I actually think your third paragraph more clearly says what we just did, said or suggested. Oh yeah, I could I could play around with that, getting collapsing that second paragraph. <clears throat> when crisis calls come in through the yeah okay, exactly through the Eugene Police non-emergency number and or the nine one one system and have a strong behavioral health component. Oh, and, and do not seem to require law enforcement and do not, you know, I got to work on this, um, and do not, do not involve a, an extreme threat of violence or risk to the person or to others, the dispatch will be rooted to the CAHOOTS team. That's an awfully long sentence. Uh, did I lose people? So, um, I think we could actually get rid of most of the second paragraph. Mm -hmm. And what's important from that second paragraph to slide into this paragraph is, um, is the, uh, the, third set, um, the second and third and fourth sentences, um, which include the information that it's a medic mental health crisis worker and also that it's a peer response per, um, person mm -hmm. with lived experience. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, your third paragraph actually clarifies what dispatch yes. does. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can flip the paragraphs. Yeah, that too. I still don't like this sen sentence. I need well, to. Well, tell you what, you can. I'll work, I'll work on it. I think you could wordsmith it. And yeah. After the meeting. Yeah. You could send it to Dan in a way that. I will. Works. I'll do that. I'll do that. Yeah, but okay. I, I, I want to echo what Booker said about now the third paragraph is um, pointing out the, starting with the uh, second sentence often the crisis worker i think all that section it's incredibly important to keep it mm -hmm. and and maybe after we talk to tim black uh to add something more if there is anything that he he brings 
mm-hmm. to the table as a sort of an extra right uh, in that paragraph yeah the but the lived somebody with a lived experience um uh, and the peer-led reference yeah <clears throat> okay so let's move to this during the 32 years of operation there have been no injuries of cahoots workers in 2019 the program reported that they had responded to 18,000 calls with only 300 and 11 requiring backup by the police. The program maintains an advisory board that includes people with lived experience. This model may be adaptable to Northampton as our local area is rich with mental health consumers, survivors, ex-patients, with experience of providing non-coercive interventions with friends and other community members who are experiencing emotional stress. Yes, Alex. I know, Carol, I think you sent us uh, some, an article on a report by the Eugene Police Department. Is that co- right about cahoots more recently? Yes, yes, I did. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm not sure this number, are, are you sure that right these here. numbers are, are accurate? They kind of had a more nuanced explanation in that report. Um, All right, let me. So let me that let me, made, I don't remember, but. That, double check um, that, yeah. I mean, might, might need to look at that report to determine. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I think this paragraph is really important in terms of talking about accountability and um, mm-hmm. sort of how we would want um, a board that oversees what's going on, what the elements of that might be. So I'm really glad you have this paragraph. Okay. Um, and I highlighting that, I think it's really important. Okay, I'll check the data. Yeah. Now, I felt that it was important to talk about, to acknowledge the current system. So there's reference here to ServiceNet. I guess I'll just read the context if we have time. Currently, ServiceNet and clinical support options are contracted agencies that respond to mental health needs. Both agencies have a large presence in the Northampton area. Services include crisis intervention, day treatment, recovery programs, residential care, family support, and programming for people with developmental disabilities and houseless people. Service contracts are negotiated with the state. CSO has contractual responsibility for risk assessments of individuals to determine whether admission to Cooley Dickinson's hospital inpatient psych unit or another facility is recommended for safety. Though the missions of both CSO and ServiceNet have grown and changed over the decades, various components of each were historically rooted in the community mental health movement that strengthened during the 1950s, which resulted, you may not want all this history, but I'm a history buff. My my point is that since the 60s, you know, the money has just never been attached to these agencies in order to serve the entire community so that they've reverted to, you know, just contracting with insurance companies, you know, et cetera. So this this original act under Kennedy envisioned this network across the country, but due to strong trends towards privatization of funding of healthcare and mental health, the full promise of this original enabling legislation was never, has never been fully met However, these agencies are dominant providers of behavioral health in Northampton community. While we are recommending significant revisions in mental health crisis responses, the role of these agencies needs to be considered within a re-envisioned response system. So how do you feel? I want to hear your comments on that. I'm sorry, Carol, before we comment about that, can we go on? Mm -hmm. I have a feeling I want to hear your next paragraph. This one? Okay. Yeah. All right, notable also is AFIA, the peer-led respite program in Northampton, affiliated with Wildflower Alliance, formerly, which is formerly known as Western Mass Recovery Learning Center, that strives to provide a safe space in which each person can find the balance and support needed to turn what is so often referred to as a crisis into a learning and growth opportunity. The AFIA house is located in a residential neighborhood and is central to a variety of community resources. It is available to anyone ages 18 or older who is experiencing distress and feels they would benefit from being in a short-term 24-hour 
peer supported environment with others who have been, quote, in there. Typical stays at AFIA range from one to seven days. The majority of staff and guests at AFIA identify as having lived experience that may include extreme emotional or altered states, psychiatric diagnoses, trauma histories, living without a home, challenges in navigating the mental health and other public systems, or living with an addiction. So now let's stop and talk about these last couple of paragraphs. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Carol. I, I have a question. Can we go for 20 seconds, go back to the previous uh, section? section? Yeah. So at the beginning, we're saying, uh, so we're talking about mental health and we're talking about, hold on, I had my copy here. Behavioral so health. The, the difference between behavioral health and mental health. Mm hmm are we are we making a differentiation between those two? No, is I think I essential or is yeah. interchangeable. Yeah, well, they are somewhat interchangeable, but it is compute. I I hear your point that we don't want to confuse anybody. Um, my understanding as a former therapist of behavioral health is that it actually was kind of a an invention of the insurance companies that only wanted to pay for behavioral change. You know, they only wanted to reimburse for outpatient psychotherapy if there was a change in a person's behavior. <laughs> now, that may be just my jaundice view of how the term got invented in the, eight, in the 1980s. But, um, you know, in, in other words, insurance companies at, at that point by the 1980s said, this psychodynamic understanding yourself and you're reflecting on your childhood and you know, get navel gazing, we're not paying for that anymore, reflection. We just want to see out behavioral outcomes that that are desired in, you know, in the in the plan for therapy, and we'll pay for that. So pretty soon the whole idea of behavioral health uh, became across all these clinics, you know, that's what you heard, and it replaced the use of the word mental health in many places. So but, Carol, you know, they can be used interchangeably, but I think we ought to go with one term. So, Carol, I, I agree with what you just said, and what you said mm -hmm. is historically and fiscally correct. Okay. I think the reason I heard this discussion coming up, though, is you can have a mental health diagnosis, mm -hmm. but it's your behavior that matters whether the police are involved or not. So, well, that's true. Yeah. And so this... I th what I was hearing in the discussions we were having last night, sort of behavioral versus mental health, is um, I'm, I'm going to use a flip example, and I'm sorry for doing this. So you have what we used to call, what we would call a personality disorder, mm -hmm. and you have that disorder, but we contract around proper behavior. And if your behavior um, if you cannot maintain a certain behavior within the setting of your personality disorder, that leads to ramifications. I, I'm putting this in a terrible, but it, it's actually the, what, how we talk about this every day at work. So I think this, when we start talking about policing, it's not, is, are people in problems because of mental health disorders? And the answer is yes. But do they run into police issues because they're actually having a behavioral disorder, um, which might have a relationship with, I don't really, I, I think we should just make a decision about whether we want to use, which words we want to yeah, use. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we're getting, uh, yeah. It, it gets, but I think yeah. what I heard the discussion last night was behavior versus having a um other diagnosis well you know what let's go with uh let, let me change it to mental health unless unless the larger commission is using another term I would. i'll tell you why because it's a more clearly understood by the public terminology mm -hmm. and um i mean also it's the root of the the problem at the end of the yeah, day yeah and the root of the yeah and i yeah, Javier, the, the thing that attracts, it, it almost doesn't matter um, 
Booker, whether somebody has what we used to call access to diagnosis or not, uh, because access to got eliminated out of the DSM. Right. Um, but frankly, people with various mental health diagnoses, regardless of their behavior, tend to be very visible to policing agents, whether they're in the police department or they're in a mental health clinic. <laughs> and they they get identified, you know, yes, by their behavior or their verbal, you know, their verbalization, and they get called problematic. So let's let's not split hairs. Let's just, if it's okay with you, let's just use mental, I'll put mental health and keep the behavioral health out of it. Um, unless that puts us out of sync with the total report of the commission. I well, agree with you, Carol. Yeah, well, I, awesome. I actually would prefer the term mental health being used throughout. Okay. The larger yeah. Report. Yeah. Alex, do you have a comment about any of this format so far? Are we just talking about <coughs> the part ab above the in bold or uh, um, the next two paragraphs too? Um, I'm I, that was an open ended question, so you can choose to answer whichever you would like. Okay. Um, Yeah, no, I, I think I think I'm good so far. Okay, so uh, by the way, what I'm thinking is what will really happen when we get to the report is what you have in the bold face is really important and it's going to be read and highlighted. Mm -hmm. um, I agree with, I agree so far with what we've read about context, though, um, I don't, I'm not going to be diplomatic. I'm not sure that that's what's going to get read. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, we'll see how this goes into the final edit. It could easily, I have information like this in some of the stuff I've written, which yeah. I moved mm -hmm. into appendix form. Mm -hmm. I like, could, yeah, it, we could, we could do that. Yeah. Here's why I'm saying this, though I don't think only the most wonkish person would read it. Yeah, as long Booker, as long as he's still at it. Yeah, I feel that the, I, I I think as long as a viable within any part of the body of the final report, it's, it's fine. Okay. I, to me, I r really like what you have in boldface, except for those changes that you've highlighted. That you're yeah, yeah, I can work on that. I can definitely change those up. Yeah. So you're saying the context? Um, yeah, the context is long, but you know, I don't mind moving it to the so the wonks can read it in the um, in the appendix. Okay. I, I, I personally have, uh, obviously, it, it must be um, fairly obvious from all this history that I threw in there, that I have a, a tremendous disappointment at what what was supposed to be the promise of the community mental health agencies, and that never really happened. Because I mean, it was supposed to serve everybody in the community, no matter what their circumstances, not just people who had insurance. So I, I am, I'm going to bring up, a, and if um, all of you can say, I don't want to talk about this. <laughs> so um, Javier brought in some witness from a person from CSO, and Alex shared um, some information. Um, um, from I'm forgetting the name of the other media person who's talking with sure people string. who who used to work at CSO and ServiceNet um, mm -hmm. issues around and we also have lots of public comment about what I'm about to ask is should there be discussion within this of concerns about the quality of treatment or the perceived quality of treatment that's happening at CSO and ServiceNet and so on. Now, if everybody thinks we should leave that alone, that's okay, but I, I just want to bring this up at this point. Javier? Uh, I think at least we need to discuss it. Mm -hmm. So the, re the, the reason behind this, it's similar to other instances where people that which have, we have reached out to people mm -hmm. uh, 
fair amount of people, and they are extremely afraid of losing the help and the benefit that they are getting from a specific service provider. So they don't come forward. They don't want it because, because the numbers in our Hampton of people being served are not are not uh, at all close to a Boston place or New York. It's really easy with anybody sharing their testimony to be easily identifiable without, even if you don't use the name, even if you don't, don't use a lot of identifiers, right? Um, so that was one of the many reasons why we haven't been able to touch with a lot of stuff going on. And I'm stating this because of CSL and ServiceNet, right? Which are two organizations that I personally have got in touch with people that they are reluctant to come forward because they are really afraid of losing the hell that they are getting. I was able to get just by chance uh, after the public hearing a testimony that everybody got from somebody who used to work at CSO. The added layer to that it's the uh, the the newspaper article that Alex forwarded to the commission. So I I think that sort of that new piece like to no new piece of information because we have heard but people hasn't been able to go public with it but i think that that now we have concrete writings about this situation we should at least sort of talk about it alex do you have thoughts about this um yeah so if we move sort of going back a little bit if we move the context uh, into the appendix, I, I do feel that there should be some explanation of maybe br a brief explanation of the other options and mm -hmm. why a crisis team um, is needed that that's different and different than what oh, uh -huh. they currently offer. Um, and that could, I don't think, it, I don't think we need to directly criticize the organizations but rather speak to why this approach uh would be better and would and you know with talking about peer um uh approach and, and such so that that's my thought to 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 mm -hmm. have some of some of that uh in our in the main body mm -hmm. because anyone who knows the current setup would say well you know I forget which organization it is, but that they sometimes have people who correspond with the police or, or there is a crisis team or, you know, and so why, why we're recommending something different is, seems important. Do you have thoughts, Carol? Well, yeah, I mean, I hear that and I'm wondering if I could um, revise this first context section by just naming the agencies that are contracted to do this work and to maybe this would be a place to insert some of the comments or actually that letter that we got from the, the former employee um, who wrote anonymously to share comments about the work at CSO. So if I was writing this, I would say, I would, I agree with Alex that I would say our current care delivery plan includes the police trying, attempting to partner with clinical support options and um, mm -hmm. service net. I said, but I, then I would say, however, there are parts of the community who. Right, right somehow talk about the fact that the community at times doesn't feel well served by this and sort of development of more peer supported community based programs so there are other choices development of other choices would be a way of doing this okay and i i i actually think i agree alex i think that needs to come out of context and up into the bold part so it it's highlighted oh okay Okay, but it's uh, but then it's not a recommend. Well, I could write it as a recommendation. Yeah, I I would like it to be. Yeah. I would like it to be a recommendation. Okay. 
Alex, can, may I ask again? So we are going to be moving towards talking about having a, likely we're going to be talking about a department. Should we be talking about departments with or within our documents or should we say here are the things we want to see happening and how does that fold into a department? I, you know, do you have thoughts about that? Well, I mean, so we have a department I, I, that has medics, EMTs, and that's the fire department. Yeah, yeah. And so um, if, if, for example, we're going to have a, uh, a follow the coots model and have a medic and then a, ideally a peer a mental health worker um, paired, how is that going to fit with the, you know, would it be that, uh, folks from the fire department would also work with the, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how that's all going to play out or, or how that could work or what the issues are. Um, so I don't, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. And I'm not sure we're, we get, we'll, we don't, we don't have time or ability to figure that all out, but, um, it, so in a sense, it's saying, Yes, we're going to recommend a new department, and uh, there's a lot of good reasons for that. And you know, we can, but we're also going to recommend this. This is how we think uh, it should. This should happen, and then the, there may be multiple relationships between departments. And I don't know that we we get. Yeah, sorry, I feel like I'm repeating myself now. I, I don't think you're repeating. I I guess my problem is is I'm hoping that there's this new department of safety has, and I guess we're not gonna talk about this, but somehow or other, the formatting of bringing into place this model is somehow within the Department of Safety. And we're, I think we're writing this document to advise this new Department of Safety of the kinds of things we would like mm -hmm. to consider. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Meaning the Department of Community Care. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, so going back to what we were talking before, right? Which is what Booker was talking about the context <laughs> and you know, the shoestring article and the, the testimony that we, we got. Um, I think, it's, I, I think it's, is there anything about that that we wanna talk about? I mean, did you know if if you guys uh, read the article or read the testimony? Is there anything there that, Carol, in your case, would change the way how you wrote the context bar? Or or not, wouldn't set up support even more what you wrote in that section? Well, I you know I think of this letter um, from the former CSO employee who talks. Um, about, it gets kind of personal here. I mean, about the clinician, the burned out clinicians and so forth. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to, I'm sorry. To yeah, I don't know. I'm sort of thinking out loud. Um, so the, the well, way- Oh, Tim Black is in the waiting room right now. Does somebody want to, can I admit him? I, and, I'm, I'm admitting him. You're at, okay, great. And what I might suggest is that we take a pause from this discussion. Yeah, meet okay. Him. Shall I stop the stop the share? Yeah. Okay. Hey, welcome, Tim. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry I couldn't make it here earlier. Um, just a lot going on for us these days. Yeah, I'm sure, <laughs> both within the program and nationally. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we realize your time is valuable, and your um, your ideas, your are, are valuable and so we will uh honor the what i had said to you that 20 minutes of um are you know addressing some some questions sure. um, it's our last week of revising um our final report before it goes to the city the mayor and the mm -hmm. city council so would anyone have a, a question that tim might be able to help with because you know we are of, of course recommending a locally relevant what we're calling a locally relevant program mm -hmm. 
uh, alternative response program that is modeled after after Kahoot. So I, I know that one of the one of one of the questions that we perennially ha perennially have uh, relates to startup costs and you know just the startup you know the relationship between the the police and sure. Then, you know, and Tim, before you say that. Um, mm -hmm. We've all read about you and know about you, but could you just say in like a minute or so, sort of what your involvement has been so that um, this is a recorded Zoom mm -hmm. call, it's part of um, city public records. So could you inter Definitely. sort of introduce yourself and what you've done and yeah. why you're here with us? Yeah, um, so my name is Tim Black. Uh, I, I head up consulting and outreach for Whitebird Clinic here in Eugene, Oregon, uh, Whitebird Clinic operates the CAHOOTS Mobile Crisis Response Program. Um, I've been with the organization for 10 years. I was hired in 2010 as a, a crisis worker for the CAHOOTS program. Um, I served for five years full-time as a first responder on the van uh, before transitioning into a role as the operations coordinator. Um, so I have experience both in uh, direct service delivery, but also on the back end of you know, operations. Uh, and I oversaw uh, multiple service expansions, including our move into the city of Springfield, where we were um, you know, engaging with a brand new jurisdiction. Uh, and, and right now, uh, we are actively consulting with about half a dozen different groups across North America who are at various stages of readiness or have uh, kind of entered into their pilot phase of implementation for services uh, inspired by the CAHOOTS model. Thank you. Excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, so on that question around startup cost, um, you know, in addition to the general labor costs, um, you know, that, that you can assume um, from this program, uh, we generally see that there's probably another $125,000 that come in the form of uh, the expense of, uh, and this is if you purchase a brand new van, uh, but, you know, to get that van, um, have it outfitted uh, in, in a similar fashion to the way that the Hoots van is styled, and then, you know, purchasing uh, durable laptops, uh, you know, equipment for uh, the medical side of services, if that's going to be a part of something that's happening locally, um, you know, if that's something your community is calling for um, and then you know bringing in a couple of trainers um, who are well versed in local issues um, you know one of the things that we do is, is we oftentimes will support communities with uh, implementation training around how we approach de-escalation or how we uh, engage with public safety systems but that's all coming from the lens of, of what we do here in Eugene and Springfield and we recognize that this is not a cookie cutter program and so hearing Carol you mentioned that you know that really kind of locally informed um, you know uh, you know, approach, um, we, we definitely really uh, emphasize uh, making sure that you, you budget accordingly to make sure that you are hearing from those local voices, uh, that there's opportunity to uh, support, you know, other community organizations by, um, you know, compensating for them, them for their time to come in and, uh, and really engage with you on program design and implementation too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You know, one of the things we were just talking about before you arrived is um, in the current, in our current system, of course, we have traditional mental health clinics that have contracts with the state sure. crisis work, but there's also a local, um, uh, it, it, we, I'm describing in the report, a very rich um, uh, population of uh, ex-patients, consumer survivors, mm -hmm. um, many of whom have ha actually had experience with suicide, you know, peer led suicide yeah. prevention and respite and de-escalation. And so, you know, having had a, State hospital here historically that closed down, you know, closed down under deinstitutionalization. We really, um, you know, we have people we can draw on who need to be um, aid. They're not volunteers, you know, be a part of the development. So, Great. so if there a way for them to be a part of your response teams, you know, and your staffing models, yes, uh, exactly, more so the better. Exactly. Yeah. exactly, exactly. So do you have? I think that's. I don't know for sure, but I, I'm trying to understand how. I'm not sure how easy that is to bring peer supported models into the model because all of the historically the funding has gone to these other organizations and they are sophisticated organizations. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the peer supported models are really community peer led. Yeah. But maybe have not been about the business of how to get grants and all mm -hmm. of the other stuff that goes with that. Do you have advice for us about that? That's yeah, that's a big challenge. Um, the the 
route that we have found um, to be promising so far has been to engage with state legislature uh, and to really um, get into the advocacy. Um, the call that I was on right before this um, is for the Oregon State House Bill 2417, uh, which is opening up a lot of funding for mobile crisis, as well as sobering centers, uh, sh low barrier shelter and crisis stabilization facilities. And one of the things that we've been working on in there is that the initial draft was mental health professionals will be providing mobile crisis response. Uh, and instead going to um, various staffing models of, you know, professional or paraprofessional professional, uh, you know, response teams uh, could be considered based on community needs. Uh, what that is doing is it's opening the door for a lot of different models to potentially be funded. Um, the other thing that we're talking about is, is just that, that um, it can be cost prohibitive for a new organization or, uh, you know, a group of like-minded community members to be able to, um, you know, go through the grant application process. Uh, and so in our advocacy for this bill uh, with the state legislature, uh, we are really strongly recommending that they consider, you know, other potential avenues um, to allow these funds to be distributed um, so that we can recognize that maybe the best fit for this isn't going to be some storied, you know, organization that has 30 years of service. Uh, but it's totally missing the mark, you know, when there is a, a community organized group that, um, you know, is, is largely grassroots, maybe inspired and formed over the past year, um, and is in a much better position to really be able to go in and make a difference with this mobile crisis response. You know, some of the other things that really help is, is getting some, you know, local leadership, um, some of the local electeds, you know, on your side and, and convince them almost that this was their idea. Uh, you know, state representatives, state senators, um, they need to be paying attention to what's happening, you know, with their constitu constituents. Uh, and for us, that has been, a, you know, a source of support over the years. That's great. You, Alex. Alex, yeah. Uh, yeah, my question, you know, Northampton is a city of 30,000 people. And, and the only mm -hmm. other city uh, that seems close to that that I know of is Olympia, Washington, I think is 45,000 mm -hmm. that has a mobile crisis response. Um, yeah. Our police department handled 35,000 calls last year. Mm -hmm. And um, or in 2019, rather. Um, and uh, so I wonder if you could speak to any thoughts rather of us being pr uh, fairly small um, mm -hmm. compared to a lot of the other cities where we're seeing these programs. Yeah, and, and Olympia is a really great example because we did a lot of work with them in the development of the crisis response unit uh, and, and helped with field training for the responders that they, they ended up contracting with for that program. Um, Fundamentally, um, in a smaller community, there aren't going to be as many resources, you know, immediately available. Um, and so um, what's happening in a more rural area here in Oregon is that they're looking at, at a countywide initiative and trying to create a countywide mobile crisis network. Mm -hmm. um, with Olympia, um, the, there was a recognition that um, any program was inherently going to be smaller than what we have, you know, here in Eugene and Springfield. Uh, and so what they, they started off with was rather than trying to do 24 seven coverage when there might not be enough of the call volume to really justify you know, the presence of those teams uh, that they tried to focus on the highest utilization hours. You know, when was it that they were most frequently seeing these calls for service come in through that public safety system uh, and took a kind of a smaller bite and said, okay, we're gonna focus on just you know, these service hours uh, before they started to branch out to 24 um, seven. We, when we started working in the community of Springfield, which is 60,000, it took us a couple of years to really build awareness in the community of the resource, you know? Uh, and so um, again, in a, in a relatively, you know, smaller community, um, I think, I think we got to recognize that um, there's not going to be as much work right away. Uh, and it actually can make it easier to um, fulfill commitments and, uh, you know, hit those metrics, you know, because um, you can, you can establish some more, you know, manageable goals with your funders. Mm -hmm. Is that something that was discovered in the first year? Or were you thinking that ahead of time to go for the, for the uncovered hours? Yeah, when we, we knew ahead of time that, um, sticking with the uncovered hours first was the right approach. Um, mm -hmm. For 26 years, CAHOOTS was not a 24 seven response. You know, we, we were operating up to 18 uh, seven and then it was an increase in funding and uh, a slew of calls for service that we were getting after 3 a.m. that really prompted us to say, hey, okay, it's time to, to move this to a 24 seven response. Mm -hmm. um, and I just have another question, which is, um, there's a sense of uh, 
from our police department currently, there's a sense of, um, well, many of these calls have a safety component and we would not feel comfortable not sending an officer at this point. Um, but there was an acknowledgement that trust, that building trust may happen over time and we may see a greater shift. Uh, do you have any uh, advice of, of how to build that trust? Yeah. Um one way to build that trust is to just be out there doing the work, taking the calls for service, responding, accepting that police are, for at least for a few months, if not the first year, going to be racing lights and sirens to these calls like they did before, um, and then see how these teams can have much more uh, successful interactions, you know, that don't result in the same use of force. Um, what we did when we started to work in, in the city of Springfield uh, was we went to every briefing. Uh, and so three times a day, every eight hours, there was a cahoots personnel, uh, you know, there to talk about the service to, Hey, um, our team's going to be coming into service in about two and a half hours. Um, you know, so when they, when they get rolling, you can call them in for that transport to sobering, you know, that, that, that you have on your plate. Um, this is somebody you could consider calling in when you see somebody who's in distress, um, you know, out on a street corner. Uh, and we, we really walk through different examples, or we would talk about a specific call type that we could respond to. Um, we did a lot of ride alongs uh, with officers in this, in the city of Springfield and with Lane County Sheriff's department uh, before the service started. So we could get to know officers. And so they could have an opportunity uh, in those, you know, more, um, uh, more intimate settings to, to ask questions that they might not feel comfortable asking in briefing in front of their supervisor, you know, and all of their co-work coworkers. Um, there's a lot of time that needs to be spent building relationships with dispatch and communications uh, because they are who are going to be making a lot of these decisions around what resources get sent out to these calls that are coming in. Uh, and so really kind of talking with uh, dispatch, uh, you know, about the fact that we sometimes will encourage people to call us back six hours later, or they're going to be calling us every day for the next week and a half, half as we move through, uh, you know, kind of a time specific uh, crisis. Uh, and, and rather than saying, you know, that helps, I think argue against the perception that somebody is calling in every day um, and they're just uh, you know malingering or they're overutilizing the system. That there are times where it is therapeutically appropriate and necessary for that individual to engage with cahoots on a on a more regular basis. Um, we have monthly business meetings with our liaisons for each law enforcement agency that we interact with. And those are opportunities for um, constructive feedback, um, for collaboration. You know, if, if we are seeing that every Saturday night, the dispatch is just, just messing up and, and our, our teams are getting whiplash because they're bouncing from one end of town to the other back and forth, we can say, hey, you know, when things are at low priority, we need to be more geographic um, with our prioritization. You know, so it's, it's really kind of multi-pronged. Um, the other thing that, that can really help um, is, is just establishing very clear expectations in the community. Um, when the community is empowered with information around what kind of response they should be receiving, and then they have an officer show up instead, that's an opportunity for them to come back and say, hey, you know, funders, we're holding you accountable. We called because we wanted mobile crisis response. There was not a violent component to this. Officers were sent out anyway. We need an answer as to why that occurred. Mm. Obvious. Accountability, yeah. Mm -hmm. Obvious. Uh, I have a question. So what kind of training programs and policies have you had to develop with this patch so, so they can handle the new service without the fear of liability? Mm -hmm. um, it starts with really having a very aggressive indemnification language in our, our contract with, our, with the cities that we work in. Um, we carry very hefty liability insurance. Uh, and there's, you know, on the city side, there's, there's insurance as well. Um, when it comes to the dispatch triage liability, because we're using 911 dispatchers, we're using that public safety system, there's already a lot of protocol built in to recognize when something needs an emergent response. Uh, there's already, uh, you know, foundational training around uh, an expectation that call takers are really assessing what resource needs to be sent out. Uh, so when it comes to how the CAHOOTS response is built into that dispatch system, we look to our scope of work within our service agreement to outline the different call types, the dispatch codes uh, that CAHOOTS team should be responding to. Uh, and then as new call takers and dispatchers are trained, there is a CAHOOTS component of the call taker training process. Uh, when there wasn't a pandemic going on, new call takers and dispatchers would do a ride along with the CAHOOTS team, you know, just kind of get a feel for, for what it was like out in the community. Um, but, but, you know, within the actual contract, within the um, algorithms that dispatch uses, you know, there's really thorough training around um, how and when to send out CAHOOTS teams. Um, the chief of police will occasionally send out a memorandum and say, hey, CAHOOTS is gonna handle all of this call type full stop 
unless somebody's bleeding out and there's a gun being fired right away, mm-hmm. send cahoots in. Uh, and mm-hmm. so we've seen that most frequently with um, the fact that um, all subject down calls are sent to cahoots for primary response. And so instead of an officer going out and waking somebody up and escalating them, you know, we have that, that cahoots response going out and making that contact. You know, same thing with welfare checks and emergency messages. Mm-hmm. Great. So uh, domestic violence calls, they, mm-hmm. are they dispatched? Uh, is the dispatch to, to another team or? It, it depends um, on the circumstances. If somebody is calling in and saying, you know, I need support and resources related to domestic violence, uh, then there's a good chance that they'll send cahoots out, you know, because that's more of a uh, resource referral and connection call. Um, okay. But if there's been an act of violence or aggression and, and you know, somebody is being removed from a home environment, uh, typically we see cahoots come in as a secondary response. You know, officers will come in, secure a scene, make an arrest, um, and then call in cahoots after there's been um yeah, after that aggressor has been removed from the scene. In those situations, the two things we're doing are either just trying to come up with a plan um, to, you know, have a better, you know, better night, better day, um, kind of figure out what's going to happen um, leading up to that person's release from jail. Uh, other times um, when things are more heightened, our role is really to just, you know, very quickly um, help remove, you know, the, the victims of that violence and then facilitate connection to the domestic violence advocacy and shelter. Uh, and we do that by, um, you know, really being just the transport to get somebody to a a confidential third party location. Uh, one of the things that we really try to do is make sure that we're protecting that, that shelter and that safe house. And so we will not transport somebody there directly. We don't want to draw attention to the right. location. Right. Right. Javier. Uh, and we just have a couple of minutes, but yes, go. yeah. So Tim, can you talk a little bit about, uh, so we were talking about the numbers, the total calls mm-hmm. that Kahoot's take is the total incidents that Kahoot gets involved. Mm-hmm. In the tiny number where that ended up with those calls having to involve police departments, yeah. right? Um, I may be wrong, and I, I asked Carol, Alex, and Booker to correct me, but one of the things that we hear constantly in the city mm-hmm. from from the police, but also from social workers saying that situations are too dangerous, that that's not going to work, that it is all the situations are too dangerous, you're always going to get one the police. Mm-hmm. Can you talk about that and how Cahoots deals with that? Because you have a massive volume of calls in, yeah. in such a small percentage of those call ends with having to call the police as a backup. Oh, gosh, this is such a, a heady topic. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, very, very basic. Um, the first thing that really helps with those different kind of outcomes and that, that much, you know, better safety track record uh, is the fact that our responders are, are trained to engage with everybody we meet um, from a place of unconditional positive regard. Uh, we have mutual trust that this is going to be a safe interaction. I'm working my hardest to keep this safe and not nonviolent. And I assume that you are going to engage in that same level of trust and you have the same commitment to a safe and and nonviolent interaction. Um, Because we don't ourselves place those involuntary holds on on patients, uh, there's a further level of safety where uh, the community knows that as long as it's just cahoots that you're talking to, there's not a risk of having your civil rights violated. Um, We um, have a lot more resources at our disposal. It's not just hospital or jail that we can take somebody to. You know, um, we aren't bound to respond lights and sirens blazing to um, you know, a shots fired call or, um, you know, a report of a, you know, a drunk driver. And so we can really dedicate ourselves to the interaction, you know, that we're having with somebody. Additionally, because we are part of Whiteboard Clinic instead of another city agency, there's a further layer of trust that, that's um, instilled in many community members who may be accessing other services of Whiteboard Clinic. And so they see the Whiteboard logo on our, you know, CAHOOTS responders when they show up. And that tells them that this is going to be that same kind of uh, service provision that they've experienced maybe at our dental clinic or, um, you know, because their counselor is, is in the white, pa- white bird outpatient behavioral health program. Uh, you know, some of the other things, uh, we have a really extensive de-escalation training uh, and scene safety component to our, our field training for our staff. And that looks at how environment can shape an interaction, um, how um, desperation and uh, restriction of, of access to resources to address basic needs can inform a situation. And so when somebody's really escalated and it's, you know, cold and rainy and at dark, um, first thing we're going to do is stop shining the flashlight on their face. We're going to set up some sort of lighting so that we can all see each other. We're going to offer that person a chance to, you know, wrap up in a blanket, have a bite, bite of granola bars and water to drink. And we'll sit in the back of the van where we have a heater going. And once that person has had a chance to really kind of take a breath, you know, let their guard down a little bit, address some of their basic physical human needs, 
then we can start to engage in a different kind of conversation. You know, imagine you're, you're starving, you haven't eaten in two days um, and you're just getting shouted out by an officer, you know, to leave, right? Um, I know how cranky I get when I skip lunch, uh, you know, and just imagine how much more, you know, escalated that can get, you know, after somebody has been told they can't be here, you know, all day long, just trying somewhere to find somewhere to sit down. Thank beautiful, you so, beautiful. So much. Yeah, no, I beautiful you need to move you out here um <laughs> everybody you know everybody that. wants to clone you i'm sure tim yeah so, uh, i'm going to ask about um accountability actually how do you evaluate whether what you're doing is what you wanted to do yeah and what i'm really asking you are do you have people who you're sort of serving as part of your input about whether what you're doing is right or not yeah um there was a recognition over the last year that we weren't listening enough to the folks that we were serving and so we have developed a stewardship council um, that is made up of, of community members um, folks with lived experience and representatives of marginalized and oppressed populations within the eugene springfield community um you know we're also really uh working on implementing better restorative justice and diversity, equity, and inclusion measures, um, both within how our organization is structured, uh, you know, but how services are delivered as well. Um, beyond that, some of the ways that we can really look at uh, our impact in the community come in the form of, um, you know, general community perception, you know, right? So looking at message boards, um, Reddit, Facebook, you know, social media, um, and, and a really good example of that is over the summer, we saw a petition that garner 15,000 signatures that uh, was calling for a reallocation of $20 million from the Eugene Police Department budget to the CAHOOTS program. Um, you know, outside of that, there are the, um, the volume of, of requests that we get from other local organizations asking for training and de-escalation uh, and, and harm reduction. Uh, additionally, you know, we can look at some very concrete metrics around cost savings from our diversions from the ER and reduce utilization of EMS, uh, which comes out to the tune of almost $15 million a year. Um, Booker, can I ask one more question? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Tim, um, I, I may be wrong on this one, but I heard back that you operate a non-hierarchically mm -hmm. structure. Is that true? Yes. Uh, Wiper Clinic is a consensus-based collective. We've been that way for the majority of our existence, um, which actually is uh, coming up on 51 years now. Um, we utilize peer supervision and... Um, you know, internal restorative justice practices to, to really address performance. Uh, we try to recognize individuals, uh, you know, experience this work differently too. And so um, as, as we, we see the impact of, you know, the work and come in the form of burnout, uh, we try to really make sure that there are um, really supportive practices in place um, to, so that folks feel, really feel empowered to uh, remain engaged in that non-hierarchical approach. Um, by utilizing consensus as our decision-making tool, we have to practice all of the same things uh, that we need to to have effective patient interaction. So unconditional positive regard, right? You know, leaning back on Rogers, um, mm -hmm. harm reduction, um, you know, very deliberate communication, uh, you know, recognition of, of you know, um, the value of diversity, equity, and inclusion um, is, is necessary for us to operate our business. And as such, we have to practice those things on a daily basis. And that really, you know, I would argue um, impacts our patient care for the better. Thank you so um, much. Boy, you're marvelous to get to talk to and <laughs> listen to. Um, we've used up all of the time that you we asked you for. I can hang on for a couple more minutes. This is, this is a good conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, are there any other questions from any of you? The, no, the, question, just... the question I have lingering is um, going a little bit further with what Javier and some of the others have brought up is we have heard concern from mm -hmm. some of our mental health agencies who would likely to be the first ones to be called on um, about their sense of safety with being included in calls. And mm -hmm. so I guess my question is, is, one, do you also have training for the providers? But I'm actually wondering, do you actually have dedicated mental health providers who are just only doing cahoots that are sort of separate from the rest of the larger mental health care systems? Yeah, most of the folks that work on the cahoots response team uh, are working full-time you know, for us, uh, but we do have some overlap, 
you know, with other service providers. And arguably that's one of the successes of our program is that because somebody might work 20 hours a week um, in case management at another organization, and then they're doing 20 hours a week on the Cahoots van, they're able to provide a lot of information and context. And so it's not just say, oh, you need to go over to this place and talk to somebody. It's, hey, you know, um, walk-in hours are Tuesdays and Thursdays from noon to two. Uh, when you go in, you want to talk to the person who, who sits at that reception desk. They're probably going to tell you to wait in the lobby, uh, but the lobby's okay. Um, there's some good magazines, you know, and the water from the, you know, the filter tastes really good. It's nice and cold. Uh, and then you're probably going to talk to Susan, because she does most of the intakes right now. So we can provide these really uh, contextual transfers of, you know, warm, and so when, when somebody like warm, goes in there. Warm handoff. Exactly. Warm handoff. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but, you know, one of the things that we, we, you know, we talk about this a lot around this, this concept of safety um, and whether it's law enforcement or other service providers, you know, how often are you being shot and stabbed in your, your clinic? You know, um, and I would argue that's probably unlikely to happen. Um, you know, in the in the 31 years that we've been doing this here in Eugene and Springfield, we've never had a serious injury as a result of patient contact. You know, yeah, we get, uh, you know, we get maybe smacked or there's a sucker punch every once in a while. In in debriefing those situations, consistently you find that um, cahoots responders were becoming attached to an outcome um, that was not complementary to the patient's experience, uh, and that patient was feeling powerless. Um, maybe they weren't feeling heard. Um, maybe we were being dismissive or, you know, the individual was triggered uh, by something that wasn't about us at all, uh, you know, and so it's, it's not that that patient is at fault, but we need to recognize that, um, you know, these are decades in some cases of trauma uh, that we're trying to confront. And so when we are mindful of our physical presence in a space, uh, you know, when we are considerate of, of the environment in which the interaction is occurring uh, and, and really recognize that the individual we're talking to is the expert in their lived experience, our obligation is to listen, empathize, and then work on immediate de-escalation and stabilization. We're not going to try and accomplish something that's going to happen a week later. We're focused on what's happening right here in this moment. And when we keep that mindset, when we keep that person in the center of the interaction, um, when we don't make promises, when we really say, okay, we're going to focus on what we need to do right here and now to improve this moment, um, then generally we see that we can have a lot safer interactions. Um, utilizing that, that dispatch triage process helps our teams make sure that when we're going out on a situation, there's not a gun being brandished, you know, and it's because dispatch is taking that time to really consider what's going on. Um, you know, our teams do occasionally need to call for that police support. And because we carry that radio on our shoulder, we're not waiting on hold with dispatch. I'm keying the mic just that, you know, when I worked on the van, I would key the mic just like I would if I was a police officer and needed something from dispatch. Because our calls are part of that same public safety system, officers are seeing what we're going out on. Um, they're aware of at least the initial details. And so when they go out to support us, they have a clear picture of what it is that we at least walked into. Uh, and so, you know, that allows for very rapid response. And when an officer shows up, that doesn't mean that Cahoots is done. Uh, the community knows that if we have to call in police, it's because there is a significant safety issue that we need to address. But if we can resolve that, get things into a calmer space, or get that contract for safety, then the officer can disengage and we can keep this back in, you know, in, in the focus of the Cahoots response team. That's a lot of experience, a lot of perspective, yeah. We totally appreciate your coming here with such short notice and, oh, and such an abundance of uh, wealth of knowledge. Totally, totally appreciative. Thank you. Um, you know, as, you, as you're looking at this and, and working on funding, um, I, I would encourage you to pay attention to the CAHOOTS Act. Um, the funding for it was mm -hmm. passed as part of the stimulus package. Um, we're working right now on uh, specifics of the law that will go along with that, um, you know, that funding mandate. Uh, additionally, um, at the state level, Oregon's uh, House of Representatives is considering House Bill 2417 right now, uh, which would create some matching grants for funding, but also opens the door for uh, crisis stabilization, sobering, and, and low barrier shelter uh, to accompany, you know, mobile crisis programs. Um, so that could be a, you know, a potential, you know, starting point, you know, as you really yeah. consider some other ways to fund this. Yeah, we have our, um, our state rep who covers this area in our mm -hmm. uh, county, basically, um, what is a primary um, sponsor of a bill that okay. hasn't gone, it hasn't gone through yet, but it, it's yeah. fun this this kind of transition and this kind of kind of uh, program development. Mm -hmm. Excellent, so, you know. And as that yeah. process moves forward, if we can help with testimony, don't hesitate to reach out. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Thank you so much, Tim. Of Thank course, you. yeah. I so really appreciate the opportunity to meet yeah. with you all this evening. Yeah. Take care. Thanks. Yeah. Bye bye.
That was cool. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. 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 You know, I when I was listening to him, I was like, oh, wow, we need to invite the chief to listen to this. <laughs> well, we can certainly send the recording. We can, yeah, we can send well, the link. No, I think this is a recording that's going to need to be played in a couple of other places. I think. Yeah, a couple other contexts. Um, yeah. Yeah. And um, are there other, I just feel so much better having heard how he talked about things. Um, mm -hmm. Being honest with other, you, if, if we were in, in the middle of drafting in the full mm -hmm. commission, I would ask to play this during the full commission. If we were not in the middle of the draft, oh, like crazy. yeah, no, no, I agree, I agree. I think there's a practical aspect to that that's going to prevent it, Javier. But I do think, uh, well, it would be just as good in a couple of weeks. You know, do you think we're going to be done next Thursday? I mean, do you think we're not going <laughs> to spend time together? <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> no, I, I agree with that. I, 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 I uh, wholeheartedly, I agree yeah. with you, Kara. Yeah. <laughs> After after we take a little time out and and you know stream some movies for a while at home, you know so we can get back together and and have a party and share this. <laughs> yeah, I wish oh. I got a break like that. <laughs> that That's that right. You I'm, have to run a, your re-election campaign. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to um, being done in certain ways with this and. Um, I think Alex is going to continue to need to carry stuff um, with this and a number of other issues. And so and I, I, I feel it was a gift that Alex has been working with us on this. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so um, anyway, let's uh, we're technically speaking supposed to be at the end of our meeting. Mm -hmm. um, are there issues that people want to discuss further at this time or name that they want to discuss? We don't have any additional uh, meetings of this subcommittee scheduled. <laughs> no. uh, so <clears throat> that, that means, you know, our task is to receive the, the report that um, my understanding, make sure, receive the report that Dan is putting together submit comment on that and also share that on Friday, but Friday will be so short. I think, I think we really have to actually um, go through the report and, and just submit all and record all of our comments. Um, and so that the, the chairs can, can try to take that in, in, in mm -hmm. doing the final version. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's, that's just what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. um, Dan, do you have comments or thoughts about this? Um, yeah, so that that is correct. This is a very tight deadline <laughs> that we're coming up against. Um, I gave folks until midnight tonight to send me things. I feel like I'm teaching again. <laughs> um, and I think I've got most of the documents. I got Booker, I got yours. Carol, I got yours. Alex, I got yours. Um, so I will be taking those individual pieces of writing, putting them in. Um, I'm expecting a little bit more from Cynthia. Uh, and I have Nick's revisions. Um, I got um, those as well. So I'll get them all into a document. So probably around 1 a.m. <laughs> uh, if you're still up and want to fall asleep, um, I'll have this very long document. Uh, I think there's going to be, um, so hopefully people have, you know, all day Thursday and then during the day Friday to look over it, sit with some things. Uh, I think there's going to be some places where we are going to need to trim uh, some things or where we might need to add um, statements, even if it's just really simple statements um, in there. But I also want to make sure that we all agree on some of the language that's used. Um, we have a couple of points that were highlighted last at the last meeting to circle back to. Um, and so hopefully we'll be able to at least list all those out. And then um, Cynthia and I can work over the weekend um, to address them and get something back out to folks so that for Tuesday we have that final draft. Uh, everybody looks at it. I's are dotted, T's are crossed. Everything looks the way it's supposed to. I'll try and add in some decent formatting so that it's more readable um, and inviting. Uh, and then 
we'll all have that sign off. We'll all have that champagne moment of this task being finished. Um, and then we'll, that will be it. Um, so Tuesday is our last scheduled meeting. So good about that. Um, well, not, let me rephrase. I'm panicking, but I feel confident that we'll be, we'll have something by the end of Tuesday that we'll all feel comfortable with. Um, Dan, do you see having other meetings like just with the chairs or co-chairs of the subcommittees with you in terms of the writing or do you think you and um, after our meeting on Friday, will it just be you and Cynthia sort of trying to process this? I'm, I'm just asking. Yeah, I mean, right now it's just Cynthia and I, if folks are interested, um, you know, you wanted to have like a, a meeting, <laughs> a meeting for it, because um, uh, that we could do. Um, we could I'm asking if that. it would be helpful, but not. Um, I mean, I will float this by Cynthia um, and also by uh, Nick and Josie and see uh, if they would like that, we can schedule that. Um, at, at this point, we could schedule it for Monday. Um, but yeah, we could do that or, or we could, we could, well, Thursday, Friday. So if we got it super early at the beginning of tomorrow, uh, we could schedule it for like the weekend as well. I don't know how folks feel about those. Um, so, um, I will reach out to Cynthia and see what she, she has for input. I was just, I was just, I'm just asking, I don't, <clears throat> there's a part of me that doesn't want to have another meeting, but uh, I, I'm, there's a, there's a happy part that says if we need to do that, I would be glad to help. Um, I appreciate and Dan, it. Dan, thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, for this. Yeah, thanks, Dan. I'm sending off, I, I got some input from the subcommittee tonight. I'm going to make some language changes and I'll get, I'll get the uh, mental health response off to you in the next hour or so. So, Alex. And Carol, I feel like we just learned so much from Tim Black. Yeah. Do you feel like you can integrate any of that in, into uh, your piece? or? I think the that... one thing I'd like to integrate is the tone. The tone. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because not only, it, you know, the one thing that I would add, maybe I'll have to subtract some things from the original recommendation piece, but... He really talked about um, the dignity that the team brings to their responses in the community and their the collaboration with the person who is in distress. And, you know, I, I did take some notes. I could use some of the language that he used. Um, I, I think what I didn't ask, I didn't want to ask any more questions. I don't know whether the White Bird Clinic is a federally qualified community health center. I can look it up on, on the internet or, or whether it was just a grassroots. My, my sense is it was created as a mental health facility as a grassroots hippie countercultural type of um, project many years ago. I don't think it's necessarily federally qualified, but they, they clearly have set a culture there and a, and a tone, even with the psychotherapy that, that pervades the, the, the Cahoots outreach too. It's very, it's very non-hierarchical. I thought that was a wonderful question, Javier. I'm glad you brought about it. Non, I, that was a really important thing to bring up yeah. because he expanded on that and it was just a beautiful thing to hear. Yeah, it, one of the things that I get that was really important what he was saying is uh, non-coercive. Yes. Right, you said it, Carol, but also how they try to avoid co the coercive systems existing, right? It's not only that they don't apply coercion, but they try to people to be connected to, to, to services that are not coercive. And I think that's really important. And they are, and, and it's not all only talking about that, but also non-coercive non treatment. Exactly. That they're very, that they're very intertwined with the clinic. And that there's uh, undoubtedly at staff meetings, they've just been evolving this culture that he described. You no, know, it's the, the most, for the lack of a better word, patient-centered um, care 
model that I've heard in a long time. Mm -hmm. And that allowing and really truly has saying that the person needing the service is actually the person in charge of what occurs. An expert in your own life. You, yeah. You've made a reference to Rogers. You know, Rogerian therapy is uh, at its core is going into the room and saying, what do you need? I, I hear you're upset. What do you need? Um, so it's, it, I mean, it's really special getting to hear that yeah. talked about. And um, I feel like I just had a meeting with my Zen master. And yeah, I, I yeah, I knew we wanted to grab him and get him here. So anyway, yeah. Okay. Well, some work to do. Other comments or thoughts? We don't, <clears throat> uh, I don't really want to talk about this yet. So I'm going to ask for a motion to adjourn. We actually don't as at this moment have another meeting of this subcommittee scheduled. Mm -hmm. um, I need to ponder that a little bit um, and think about that. I think we may, I would like to have a closure meeting um, or, or sort of a meeting that talks about where do we go from here? Um, it, not necessarily closure, it could be other things. So, um, I'll ask you all to ponder that. And if that's something you're interested in after we're sure that there aren't other kinds of meetings, that's something we could look towards um, organizing. Okay, Because um, we've spent a lot of time together and um, I want to give an opportunity for us to be able to reflect on that in, um, in a way. Okay. Are, I'm now willing to accept a motion to adjourn. I move that we adjourn. Second. Is there a second? Ah, Alex has seconded. Um, Noah, are you still there? Yes, there you are. Hi. <laughs> um, yes, Booker. Yes. Javi here. Yes. Alex. Yes. And Carol. Yes. Awesome. All right. Not yeah. about voting, no, just as a. <laughs> I'll think say I'll think about it. Yeah. I'll think about it. Anyway, good night you guys. Good night. Hi. Um thank you. Yeah. Good night everybody. <laughs>